Today, I'm joined by Dr. Cedric Books. He is a research professor at the Catalan Institute for Advanced Studies of the University of Barcelona, where he studies the cognitive neurobiology of language. Cedric, welcome to the Nature and Nurture podcast. Thanks for having me. Thanks for taking the time to be here. So how did you first get interested in this field? Were you more on the linguistics end and then the biology came later? Or were you on the biology end and the, the linguistics came later? Uh, it's, it's hard to know which came first. I think what came first is, is really the philosophy of it. So I, I was interested as an undergraduate in, in philosophy of mind and heard about Descartes and, and uh, at some point also for, uh, you know, the reading about politics, I heard about this guy called Noam Chomsky. Uh, that uh, was famous also for linguistics and also for, for studying uh, the mind, for studying cognition. So I got interested in this because uh, Chomsky promised that studying uh, language could actually tell us something deep and interesting about uh, human cognition and ultimately human biology. So I've always thought that these three fields um, uh, the language sciences, uh, philosophy, and, and biology, at least um, can be brought together uh, and uh, can generate, you know, an interesting intersection, as it were. And that's what I've been um, trying to do since then. I focused primarily um, on, uh, on the linguistic side of things, um, mm -hmm. but gradually realized that you know, I had to get my hands dirty with um, biological details if if I really wanted to, you know, to make good of the promise that ultimately we would get to the biology. It turns out that uh, it's hard uh, if you if you don't <laughs> do biology. Right. So Chomsky was one of the early advocates for language is innate, right, as opposed to something like humans are a blank slate and you learn it over time. That's right. Uh, he uh, he and, and a couple of his friends like Eric Lenneberg and Morris Halley in the 50s uh, were really um, trying to, to move away from the then dominant behaviorist, uh, you know, um, uh, I hesitate to say theory, say perspective or viewpoint uh, that mm -hmm. was uh, so certainly dominant in, in Cambridge, Massachusetts when they were uh, students there. And yeah, I think that that's been a big theme, a big theme uh, since yeah, since the fifties, pretty much. You know, you have this uh, very um, heated discussions about whether it's, things are innate, things are learned. I think that there's actually a lot more agreement in between the lines. <laughs> uh -huh. But uh, but yeah, it's a, it's a, he was certainly an early advocate of of the need to recognize an important and significant contribution of, of, of biology. Right, right. yeah, because the, the innate se thing seems really related to biology in the sense that if, if that is the case, then where, that's where it would come from. That's right, eventually that's where it would come from. Turns out it's very hard to, to figure out, you know, what the, what the biological underpinnings are. But yeah, you expect to find something or some things uh, that would uh, help uh, the learner. Yeah. And then the big question, which perhaps we'll get into, is how specific that information is. And, and the linguists, as it were, placed their early bets on something being very specific uh, to, to language in that innate component. I think that turned out not to be quite uh, right, uh, but it's certainly the bet that they made at the beginning. So would, would the contrast to that be something like, it's not specific to language, it's just this general high intelligence that humans have and language is one way that we can use that? Well, I, I don't like the word intelligence too much, but I think yeah, the, the contrast would be as opposed to something uh, information specific, like dedicated to language and, and only uh, to language, the contrast would be a learner that recruits uh, uh, cognitive biases, cognitive priors that are much more general in character. Um, that means those that can be found in other cognitive systems, not specifically, you know, in language. 
but also potentially, and this is particularly interesting to me, uh, in other species, right? Because, uh, it, you know, uh, first the philosophers and the linguists like to say that language, you know, is something like a species specific trait. Mm -hmm. And, and that, of course, makes it very hard for the biologists to, uh, to study because biologists love to compare, not contrast. Uh, and, you know, if you tell them, well, it's only us, then, uh, then it makes their job much harder. Uh -huh. We should define what we mean by language, because I think most people <laughs> think of, of like spoken language and maybe syntax. But then mm. in this more philosophical sense, language might be something like abstract symbolic representation of information i think that's right how many hours do we have to define language <laughs> we <laughs> no, have it's, one it's, hour it's very hard actually you know because you know this is such a term uh that's yeah difficult to define that's a term that so many people use in many different ways that it's very often these heated discussions arise from the fact that people don't quite mean the same thing or don't you know use the same definition as it were i think it's hard also to define language for another reason that we've come to appreciate uh, i think over the past maybe decade or so and and it is that language is not one thing it's really many different um cognitive subcomponents if you want that are brought together um in specific tasks, for example, in communication, but also in thought. And, you know, it's, it's really hard to find a definition that, uh, that gets at all these components at once. Uh, and, and again, for the biologists, it's a good thing if language is sort of like a mosaic, you know, consisting of bits and pieces that you can find in, in different animals scattered as it were. But for, for the linguists or the philosophers, that's not a great definition when you say it's a bunch of, of very different things, right? And so you're right that for many people, very often language is used as a term to refer specifically to well, things like syntax or thought or communication. And this is where the disagreements um, happen, as it were. Yeah. Seems like a paradox that you have to use language to define language. That's right. And I think that in part, um, you know, we all have at some level an, an idea of what language is because we use it all the time. Right. And that, in a certain sense, gives us the impression that uh, we all know what it is. Right. Uh -huh. um, it's not like a very complex concepts like, I don't know, those that they use in physics or something. Right. Um, but at the same time, it uh, leads to discussions that are often not very well informed because those definitions of language, I mean, our notion of language, our folk definition of language is, is very often not appropriate. Right. And even um, things like physics, people can describe as a language. I mean, it, it's sort of a poetic term if you say the language of the universe, but then in the technical sense, something like an equation still contains information and it's written down. And that seems kind of similar to to normal written language? In a certain sense, uh, that's right. There is a, a technical notion. In, and of course, like all technical notions, um, they are hard to, as it were, export from one field uh, to the next. And that uh, makes the, um, th makes certain issues uh, about language uh, very difficult to, uh, to convey. It, it's not that it's impossible to convey, but it just makes it harder for people in very different fields to abandon the sort of preconceived idea they have about language and, and, and then agree on a technical definition. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So in your own research, what does it look like when you're both studying language and when you're looking at the neurobiological aspect? Well, I think... Um, so I, I wouldn't be able to give you like a one sentence definition of it, but uh, here are a couple of components of a, I think a, a good definition of what language should be like. First of all, there should be some sort of notion of evolution in this. That is, it's a system uh, of the mind. So it's an aspect of our cognition uh, 
that evolved, uh, like other things that evolved, that is that means that it probably has a very long history um, and consists of many different subparts, right? So that's certainly one thing. So it's not one component, but many. Another thing uh, that I think must be part of a, an, a good definition of, of language is that it's not just about spoken language. Uh, it's now clear that, um, you know, language is a multimodal uh, system that, uh, yeah, very often relies on the spoken uh, medium, but it can also make use of um, gestures. So we have sign languages that are perfectly um, as complex as, as spoken languages. And in, in these modalities, um, each contribute uh, to making language what what it is so we shouldn't we in that definition we shouldn't uh, just um, collapse language and spoken language or speech i think that, um, that this sense. is a mistake that uh, that people often make i think another component of that definition of language is that it's certainly a tool that creates meaning uh, so it's a tool that's used for thought and communication to convey some fairly complex thoughts to others. And um, so I'm opposed to uh, this, uh, this dichotomy of asking whether language is for thought or communication. I think it really uh, contributes to both. It's certainly an important um, way in which we communicate, but I think it's also a system of cognition that enables us to, uh, to combine ideas and thoughts in ways that are special in some sense. Mm -hmm. so even thought that, seems kind of like communicating to yourself, maybe to your future or past self. Um, yeah, I think that there is certainly an internal aspect uh, of, of language that, um, uh, yeah, is probably a, a way of communicating across different cognitive systems of the mind, as it were, so internal to oneself. I think that it certainly is not something that's an either or communication or thought. I think that these things are much more closely related and intertwined than um, mm -hmm. many think. Does your own work looking at the biological aspect of language, does it focus only on humans or do you also do comparative work with animals? So, uh, great question. I, I think at the beginning, uh, I made a mistake of, of uh, following uh, the line of thought that was specific to humans. And, and you know, so it was such a design, a, a defining feature of us that it's very easy to convince oneself it's just about us, right? And like I said, that makes the job of the biologist very hard. So if you um, if you stay away from the biology, I think it's sort of okay to think that it's only us, right? But if you really try to get closer to to biological descriptions and and components, then I think you really have to embrace a comparative method. And when I say embrace a comparative method. I don't just mean, you know, looking at our closest uh, living relatives, for example, chimpanzees and bonobos, and ask questions uh, about them. But I mean a very broad um, uh, spectrum that uh, tries to learn about the cognitive capacities and uh, systems of communications of, of birds, of bats, of uh, whales, of tons of different species. Um, the, each of which I think contributes something to, uh, uh, you know, tell us something about one aspect of human language. Um, right, that seems to, to have the, the evolutionary component you mentioned. Yeah, that's, that's the one. I mean, without that component, if you, if you look at um, Darwin's big books, like Origins and Descents, they all start with the, with the notion of comparison. So it starts with when we compare or by comparing. Right? And, and, and linguists should do this a lot, uh, a lot more. 
than, um, than they're used to. That is, they should really uh, think that uh, one very good way of learning about us and what makes us human is actually to go uh, beyond us and look at what other species are, uh, are doing. Right. So the next component you mentioned was that language isn't only spoken language, but mm -hmm. from an evolutionary perspective, like every animal I can think of, like humans or birds or whales, they all seem to use auditory language. So why do you think that is, that it converged on using this mechanism of communication? Mm, I think the examples you meant are great uh, examples of uh, evolutionary convergence, not on speech, because, you know, again, speech is defined in so many ways that sometimes it's so human specific, but certainly convergence about um, this ability that's called vocal learning or sometimes voc uh, vocal production learning of being able to essentially imitate um, conspecifics in their uh, vocalization, right? But there are other animals that rely on, on um, other uh, modalities uh, and have very sophisticated systems of communications like our closest um, um, relatives, the chimpanzees and the bonobos don't seem to have such an elaborate way of uh, imitating sounds among themselves, but they certainly deploy a an interesting system of uh, gestures that uh, convey meaning. And it's precisely for this reason that um, quite a few linguists thought that uh, the origin of, of human language was to be found not in, in, in the vocal modality, but in the gestural um, modality, just because, you know, our closest uh, living relatives um, don't display the, the the sort of abilities that you're right we find in in other species like parrots songbirds bats and and others and i think um the reason i insisted on saying that language is multimodal is because i think um it's not going to be one or the other i think we'll we, we've managed somehow in the course of our evolution to to recruit abilities from the gestural domain, but also from the vocal domain. That makes it particularly interesting. I've heard some primates will have different vocalizations for predators, like they'll have different warning calls for different animals. Mm. Yes, uh, the, the, it, it's not the case that um, um, you know other primates don't vocalize, they do. But um, for many of them, I think most of them really, the consensus is that these vocalizations are innate and that is there is very little learning from conspecifics unlike us where it's clear that you know uh, we learn the language of the community in which we are raised right? and, and this is why uh, when people have tried to understand this ability we have to you know adopt uh, the sounds of the community as it were they have had to move uh, at least at first, away from primates. I say at first because the more we uh, study this ability called vocal learning, the more we realize that it's a continuum. That is, it's not just black and white where some species have it and some species don't. It's probably the case that if you look hard enough, uh, even among uh, non-human primates, you will find some ability, some vocal learning ability that doesn't compare very well with what you find in, in parrots, say, um, but could nonetheless have played an interesting role in the course of our evolution, right? Because it, it provides a, a little substrate. And this is, uh -huh. this is work, I think, that will um, become more and more prominent in the near future where people learn to, to look deeper into abilities that are not perhaps so obvious, uh, but mm -hmm. are nonetheless uh, there. Right. So at the two extremes, if it was all innate, you could have a human baby in absence of socialization, they clearly won't learn language. So, so it can't be all innate. And then also, if it's all learned, you can't stick like a chimp baby in with humans and it won't, it won't learn like we do. So it's, some, it's somewhere in between. And it seems like it's something like 
I don't know, something about our brains is, is more attuned for learning than other animals? Yeah, you know, so the, the, the language instinct is really the language learning instinct, right? Uh, it's it's this, in, this instinct we have to learn. Um, but I want to qualify a little bit what you said. I, I think it's, it's, it's nice to put it the way you did in terms of two extremes, like um, innate and learned. But I think it's also important to realize that the notion innate itself is not, is not one thing. And um, uh, Kevin Mitchell has written a, a, a wonderful book, actually entitled Innate, um, where I interviewed he, him a while ago. Ah, okay, great. Um, where he stresses the fact that innate just doesn't mean, you know, inborn, as it were. There is an important developmental perspective on innate that I think uh, it, it is also extremely valuable for, for the linguist to take into account and inform this discussion of, of two extremes, you know, innate versus um, versus learn. It looks like a dichotomy, but it's really like... Um, a three-way distinction. There is development in between, right? It's it's what uh, Dick Lewontin uh, called the triple helix, right? where you have uh, the genes, you have the environment, and then you have noise or development in the middle, and that's a significant component as well, uh, which I should say is not really well studied by linguists. That is, linguists have been extremely... Uh, a dichotomous in their vision of, of language. It must be either inborn or learn. Mm -hmm. Right. It seems like the, the key to this whole understanding the biological aspect lies in that interaction because <clears throat> whatever happens with our genes or our brain mixing with the environment differs from in a, in a way that allows us to learn language in, in a way that animals can't. Th that's correct. It's really um, an ability that emerges um, in the course of development. That is, it's not there from the beginning. It's not there in the environment alone, but it's in, in, in that middle ground uh, created by both actually the biology and the environment that and the disability emerges. And that actually makes it very hard uh, to to find a term for this, so you know, I I among others have often used the term a language ready brain to talk about this ability that our brain has to you know to learn language. But even that, and I think that's a good term. But even that term suggests that there's a point where the brain is like ready for language before it gets into the environment where language is used and that's not the case it's really in the course of of development and, and language use that the brain becomes ready for language as well right? uh -huh. there's also a certain critical period right like if if a child is raised up to a certain age outside of language then it becomes much harder or maybe impossible to teach them it's certainly much harder for me to learn anything now <laughs> right yeah so why do we go from language ready at the beginning to because you would think that as you grow into an adult you get smarter and it would be easier <laughs> yes so i think that's why uh in in part i i was reluctant to 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 use the term intelligence i think it's it's not about intelligence as such it's not about learning tricks to to learn language it's really um an ability that's very similar to other, as it were, physical abilities that we have that somehow are um, come with a certain developmental schedule um, and that must, um, you know, take place within a certain uh, window of time. Afterwards, um, you are, as it were, stuck. And I think Eric Lenderberg was, I think, the first to, to really insist that this was a very important property of, of the language system, this sensitive or critical period. And, and there is debate as to, you know, when exactly it closes, but um, what it does, but, but I don't think there is a meaningful debate to uh, the fact that it exists. I mean, it's there. And I think that this is a property of language that we should uh, try to capture and understand uh, biologically, that is, how come the circuits 
we use to to learn language um, have this uh, this schedule, as it were, attached to them. And that's something we know there, but really don't quite understand. I think deeply. Do we have any any hints at as to why that might be the case, either biologically or maybe from an evolutionary perspective? Mm, it's it's nice you say why. I'm, I'm sure you've heard, or maybe you've even read, uh, the, the famous paper by Tinbergen on the four why questions, you know, where he mentions that in order to understand the system, you want to understand the mechanism, the development, the function and the evolution. And I think your why question is, is, is really four why questions, like what's the mechanism, what's the, what's the development of it, like how does it develop, why did it evolve, and what's its function, big questions. Uh, I tend to think, mm, this is a, a research bias of mine, I admit that until we have a good handle on the mechanism, um, it's very hard to, uh, uh, to give good answers to the other why questions like why it's there in terms of function or, or, or evolution as it were and given that we don't have a very good mechanism i don't have a very good answer uh, for you uh, it's um yeah uh, it, it's just something that uh, we can only hope we'll understand better mm -hmm. later but so far that notion has been with us for decades and uh, mm -hmm. yeah, it's, it's, it, it's still a very big puzzle. Mm -hmm. So does ongoing research to find this mechanism, is it something like learning at, looking at different areas of the brain and trying to see what they do and seeing how much that might relate to language or whatever particular function you're looking at? Mm. I wish it were more than this. I mean, it's certainly part of uh, the the general approach, namely. Uh, it, it makes a lot of sense to try to see which circuits are implicated and so which brain regions, like localizing those circuits and so on and so forth. But I think here uh, um, I'd like to, to uh, as it were, quote uh, David Puppel, who um, likes to distinguish uh, maps and mapping. Uh, he likes to say that just saying where in the brain something is happening, or like where exactly, which region is more active, is not going to tell you exactly uh, the mechanism, namely, you know, how, how it's happening, right? And so it's good to know where, but I think there's going to be tons of questions after the where. Like, suppose I can give you, uh, like, uh, the top three regions, I don't have them, but suppose I give you the top three regions implicating, a, I don't know, learning sounds or something like that, uh, as, as you grow and, and learn the language, then the next question will be, well, why these regions as opposed to others? And what exactly do they do? Uh, I mean, what makes those regions fit for the task? I mean, how, how did evolution pick as it were those regions as opposed to others so all questions that you know mm, knowing where it's happening mm, is just the beginning right uh, and, and 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 in a certain sense the other questions are are, are much harder mm -hmm. so which questions does your own research attempt to tackle and, and what approaches do you use for that Good questions. I think um, there are two, uh, um, I don't know if they are big, but there are certainly two questions I'm, I'm, I find particularly intriguing. So I, um, I would like to understand uh, uh, a bit better, and certainly in the context of language, traits that um, have long been used to quote unquote define um, say the, uh, the anatomy or neuro anatomy of, of our species in, you know, uh, which is like the fact that it's not just our brain that we think is somehow a bit special in ways that, you know, still remain to be understood, but also the fact that um, our head is, is configured in a certain way. You know, we used to think that, for example, um, the, the the configuration of the larynx is particularly important for speech. Now we understand that the brain is also playing a role, but it's certainly the case that our overall like craniofacial phenotype 
is uh, specific. And I'd like to understand uh, what this could tell us about uh, cognition, because we know that certainly very early in development, um, say uh, the uh, parts of our um, anatomy that becomes the face are very closely related to how the brain develops. So there is a question there that I'd love to, to understand better. And then we also know that our uh, cranium has a particular shape that looks like a, a football as opposed to a, a, a rugby ball, right? It's not elongated, it's round. And we now think we now know uh, with reasonable confidence that this shape arises from the way the brain develops. Mm, and in particular, from the way certain parts of the brain develop, like the cerebellum, the bit of the brain at the back of our skull, seems to expand at a particularly interesting point in our development and, and shapes our, our brain and then skull in, in particular ways. And I'd love to understand what this did to cognition in general and to language in particular, right? And I'm fascinated by uh, the moment in time we are living in where we actually have access uh, not just to a range of species that can tell us a lot by their behaviors, but also we have access to genomes of uh, species that are extinct, like the Neanderthals or the Denisovans. And, and so I'd love to find a way to, to exploit that information, to try to see what we can learn about our own uh, brain uh, evolution, because those aspects that I mentioned, the face and the skull, seem to be quite, uh, I mean, let's say fairly recent and, and specific. So uh, I, I think we are at the stage where, um, to me, the, the, the direction of research is what can we learn, for sure, what can we learn about the brain that eventually you know, forms the substrate for, for language and cognition, but also what can we learn about the genome, about brain development, about cognition, that is how much so if I give you the genome, for example, of an extinct species or even a living species, how much can you then, I wouldn't say predict, but understand about uh, brain development by just, you know, having that kind of information available? And then how do we translate that information uh, all the way up to cognition, as it were? That's really the, 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 the creating a so, linking hypotheses across these various levels of analysis from the genomes to the brain level to cognition is, is what I do. I'm trying to then understand uh, the face, the skull. So when you're looking at, at variability in skull shapes mm -hmm. or in, in genomes, mm -hmm. um, what are, are the in, within group or between group differences bigger? Like if you would look at modern day humans with a large variability versus comparing averages of different species, which of those tends to be more useful? I think all sorts of informations are useful. What I think um, is the case is we certainly don't have enough yet um, data about um, uh, the real amount of variation for many, many questions we are interested in. Uh, it's true that um, biology nowadays uh, gets, you know, gives you a lot of of information that we didn't have uh, before. Um, but I think we need a lot more. And that is, there's still lots of underrepresented uh, groups, um, lots of um, understudied species. And, and all of these um, must somehow uh, uh, be aspects that we should focus on if we want to understand um, anything really, because uh, the, 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 the key, uh, uh, as it were, the key information will come from variation at, at all levels. So we should really have a very good handle of the variation and not, um, and, and be aware that currently the, the information we have is biased in many ways. That is, it's not representative of the whole uh, variation that we know exists. Uh, that's true in, uh, in genetics, that's true um, for various aspects of, of cognitions, you, for example, we were mentioning um, how different species can inform, you know, uh, 
us about language. I think it's the case that, um, you know, there's still lots of species that we haven't looked at carefully uh, that could be extremely informative. I mean, we, we tend to stick to those species that give us a lot of information at first and then somehow it, it uh, you know, it becomes routine that we only think of, of, of just a couple of them as opposed to trying to, uh, to really uh, take advantage of the full spectrum of variation that we see. So I'm sure this would be an oversimplification, but is, is something like you'd be comparing, let's say, an extinct species or, or maybe even just another species like a chimp mm -hmm. skull with a human skull, mm -hmm. and then also compare the genome and see like, okay, the skull is different in these specific areas and the genes are sp different in these specific areas. So maybe these genes lead to these changes. Yeah, that's that's really an oversimplification. <laughs> I think we, it, we, it can. Uh, so the beauty of, of of biology, I think, is that it's complex, and so you can't you can't really uh, just infer uh, shape or behavior from the genome. Um, of course, that doesn't mean that there is no information whatsoever, that it's uh, hopeless, right? I think it's just a matter of learning that um, the, the distance between genotype and phenotype, whatever phenotype you're interested in being like physical or cognitive or behavioral, um, the key is to understand that there, there is a link between genotype and phenotype, but that link um, really goes through a very long and complicated uh, route. And the beauty of our, our job is to try to figure out what that route is, but also to learn that the answer won't be simple. So, um, yeah, we may have, for example, information about, um, you know, uh, um, facial evolution, in the fossil record, for example, or, you know, variation uh, in, in the current population. But we have to learn how, you know, information from the genome uh, is indirectly related to what you can observe. And, and that indirectness is, is of course, a, a source of, uh, of good work. I think that it's really very important to, once you realize the distance between genotype and phenotype, you realize there's really wonderful questions uh, left to answer. But yeah, it's, it, it would be nice if it were simple, but maybe, uh, you know, it's better if it's complicated that way we have things to do. Yeah. Are there any specific findings that you have that you think would be simple enough to discuss? Well, there are a couple that I think we have made progress on. And when I say we, I see it's really just a community, not just in, in, in particular. I think, for example, the, the importance of the cerebellum that I mentioned uh, before as a, as a region of the brain is, uh, that, that matters for, for cognition, uh, but not just for like motor cognition where people have known this for a long time, but also for other aspects of cognition like language or you know what's sometimes called high level cognition, whatever that means. Um, I think the recognition that, um, that it's not just the, the neocortex that does all the fancy bits of cognition and language, but it's also other parts of the brains that are just as important or maybe in fact, perhaps more important, I think it has really been an interesting development uh, for me, like trying to find out how the textbook picture, for example, of how we understand, um, you know, language in the brain. If you open an, a textbook, you're bound to find, you know, Broca's area, Wernicke's area, and then, you know, a link between the two. Turns out it's, it's really massively more complex. There's lots more regions involved. I think that's been a super interesting development that uh, it, it's forced us to ask questions, but what do these understudied regions contribute to the neural aspects of language? That's been one thing. The other thing we've been uh, working on a fair amount on is, is the evolution of the face and how it relates to the brain. So it turns out that 
there is, like I said, a, a stage in development uh, very early on where uh, the, the two systems, you know, the, the, the cells that eventually will produce uh, the face and, and, and then the brain um, are uh, enter into an interesting dialogue. And understanding this very early stage of development um, it, it has been something that's uh, given us a lot of, uh, of I think, interesting uh, findings. So one of the things we have looked at a lot is, is uh, uh, the neural crest, that is a population of cells that really develops very early and uh, eventually gives rise to aspects of the face, but also influences the brain. And it turns out that, um, and the, you know, several um, uh, conditions that we find in the populations that are called neurochristopathies are disorders related to the neural crest. Um, and one perhaps you've heard of is, is Williams syndrome, uh, a syndrome that um, gives rise to a characteristic craniofacial phenotype, but also a characteristic aspects of cognitions where language is preserved, but other aspects of cognition are, are more damaged, let's say. And trying to see how we could understand the biological roots of that syndrome in terms of for example, the neural crest has been particularly um, enlightening, at least to me. So some of these, some of these um, genetic differences that result in external changes also change change the way you process internally. I think so, and that's that's cool to know. So you know, when I when I talk about this, people uh, try to think, oh, but wasn't this discarded? You know, theories that somehow the the, you could predict cognition from the shape of the skull. And no, of course, that's not the point. Uh, the point is to realize that in the course of development, and certainly very early in development, uh, these systems um, interact closely with one another. And that stage of development is worth looking into because you can understand how, um, you know, uh, learning something about you know, early facial development could also tell you something about the brain, not predict cognition, but mm -hmm. uh, give you valuable information about uh, a brain development. And eventually, like I think we said early on, um, it's going to be key, certainly for language, but also for other aspects of cognitions to really insist on um, brain development being, you know, the thing to try to understand much better mm -hmm. because that's where that's where the fun is how early in development are we talking we are talking about you know um well before birth uh mm -hmm. you know there is a stage where you know uh, the body is is, is is taking shape as it were and the brains some areas of the brains haven't developed really well enough for example the cerebellum develops much later um, mm -hmm. in, in, in development but very early in development uh, we have um, you know series of cells like stem cells like the neural crest that provide critical input to aspects of the body and so um, any deficit that um, you know address that, for example, affects the neural crest in terms of induction or migrations of these cells will have long-term consequences that can be then studied at the level of cognition. So it's very, very early in development. And how do you and study then, that uh, when, when they're still in the womb? Mm, that's really great uh, that you asked because it, over the past now, mm, certainly five years, but maybe a little bit earlier already, um, people have um, I think learned that there is a, a remarkable window of opportunity uh, that can be, uh, I, I think that can be exploited for cognition as well, and certainly for neuroscience. And here I'm referring to the field of uh, brain organoids, which I'm sure you've heard of, which is this um, um, enterprise of trying to, as it were, recreate in a dish, in the lab, some aspects of very early brain development, right? By uh, uh, 
uh, using the power of uh, stem cells reprogramming to try to see if you can, yeah, like I said, reconstruct aspects of development in, in 3D. And so this has been uh, something particularly useful because it gives you insights into a stage of development that otherwise wouldn't be accessible. Like you said, certainly in vivo you can, but they are now in vitro techniques uh, that, that enable you to to look into this, to ask questions and, and manipulate things experimentally to try to gain insight into those mechanisms of early development. So I think it's a very important um, new tool in our toolbox to study cognition eventually. And now I should say that, of course, like any new technique, there is always a lot of hype uh, when there is a lot of hope. And, you know, just like before we we're saying that there is no shortcut from genotype to phenotype, likewise, um, looking at early brain development in a dish, like looking at a brain organoid, will not tell you immediately everything you want to know about cognition, but it uh -huh. will inform your understanding of the, as it were, the neural scaffolding uh, that eventually give, produce a brain that's able to learn uh, things mm -hmm. in, in particular language. You know, it's, it's a bit like mm, when, you, when you build a building, you have to rely on, a, on, on scaffolds to, to get there. And, and you, you know, the scaffolds are not the building, but they are very important uh, for the building to eventually be there. And those early uh, developmental stages are not cognition, they are not the building, but they are extremely important in understanding um, how the building eventually stands, as it were. And so in our case, how the brain does what it does. Uh -huh. So in that case, is the biggest gap between whatever stage that you're no longer allowed to continue growing the organelle and between birth? Um, I think there are many gaps still so there are uh, like i said uh, regions of the brain that have a protracted development like for example the cerebellum that postnatally expands uh, um, dramatically more than say the than you know other aspects of the brain and that's still very difficult to to reproduce uh, mm -hmm. you know in a lab and so different regions have different developmental schedules and i don't think we have yet a very good handle on on combining all of them and as we know now the brain it's pretty much all the parts of the brains that are involved so you would like to have like a, a holistic view of it but you only have the bits and pieces that grow differently so i think we are not there yet but we can i think build on what we have and and look forward to to important discoveries uh, in the future right so much of what we've discussed seems like it's not specific questions that are getting answered and then moving on it's just large-scale questions that we're slowly chipping away at yeah i i think that's right uh but i think that's that's also progress you know when i was um uh, an early graduate student i was told that uh, one couldn't study things like the evolution of language, that it was impossible, that this was something that, yeah, one can do when, you know, after retirement, like some sort of a science fiction uh, bit, right? Um, but we have come to uh, learn that they are very indirect ways of approaching uh, the questions. But I think mm -hmm. um, yeah, even though they are very indirect, it's possible to do this. Uh, it's just that it's going to take a long time. But uh, mm -hmm. yeah, that's in part what makes it exciting. Yeah, yeah that is exciting. Mm -hmm. what, do, what do you think uh, the field might look like uh, in a couple years or decades? What, what do you think some of the next major realistic leaps forward will be? Well, I think, um, you know, the uh, future is really very hard to predict. But I think one thing I can say for sure is that uh, the things that uh, graduate students uh, say interested in language uh, or, or cognition uh, will learn in the near future will look very different from uh, what say I was learning as a graduate student. And I'm not saying in terms of content, but also 
um, you know, methods and um, topics of study. So uh, specifically for language, the curriculum of many, uh, you know, graduate programs was fairly fixed. You did a bit of syntax, semantics, and maybe, you know, one course on uh, language acquisition, and maybe a bit of neuroscience, and that was it. Um, but I think that in the near future, perhaps in some cases already now, but a cognitive scientist or linguist will have to learn about uh, genetics, will, uh, will have to learn about many more aspects of developmental neuroscience, will have to learn um, many things that don't look linguistic -y, as it were, right? that uh, you know will be a part of the toolkit that you know uh, we all these will not be familiar with and i think we can only think um, that the study of language i think will largely not take place in linguistics department in my opinion i think that it will be really um, an aspect of biology and therefore will be studied um, in in biology centers, as it were, because the techniques um, will be there for, you know, not just for biologists to ask questions about, but they will need the linguists to also inform the experiments, mm -hmm. uh, to learn those techniques. And, you know, you can't really say something intelligent about um, experimental design if you don't know enough about what the experiment could tell you so linguists will have to learn enough about the limitations and 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 you know the objectives of a particular experiment in order for mm -hmm. them to contribute to this so i think that one thing we'll see is that um the the language sciences um will turn out to be much broader than the linguistics programs we currently have yeah, that's exciting. It seems like many areas of science are moving in that more interdisciplinary direction. Yes, the, the thing is not just to say it, the, the thing is to do it. Right. Mm. Thank you very much for your time, Cedric. Uh, thanks again for the invitation and thanks for the discussion.